Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk About House. I'm Todd. I'm Juana. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the housing forecast by looking at Federal Reserve data. This is from the um, Federal Reserve website. Uh, two things. First of all, um, the data, it's just, it, the last data it has is January. That's because this data takes over a month before it's updated. And uh, so this, so it, we don't get the actual January data till the end of like the month has passed. Right. So it's so, end of February. So if you like charts, if you like data, please subscribe, hit the notification bell, like the video, share the video, and hang on for charts. We're going to blow your mind. Here we go. Okay. One more thing really quick. The, the video that we did yesterday that was the where we talked about the interest rates. So interest rates have been very volatile like the last week. Mm -hmm. And we like we got the data th th from like three days ago, and then we did the data, the video like two days ago, and then we aired the video. So in the like four days, like it changed substantially. So a lot of people thought like it was an old video that we, <laughs> and it's not an old video. Literally, it just like literally, we made the video and then it aired, and then all, you, a lot changed. So we apologize for that um, because you know you, it's not instant. Mm -hmm. Plus, you may. Anyway, so that's just that's the thing with the data. But a lot of comments were, "Oh, this must be an old video." It wasn't an old video; <laughs> we just made it. But, okay, let's get on. With okay, it. let's go. Okay, so we're going to talk about housing. Um, so we're going to start with the chart, and we'll just talk about. Um, okay, so one of the things forward looking for um, the housing market is inventory. Okay. Now, why is inventory important for the housing market? Like, what's so, that? Why does it even matter? Okay, so inventory is important for any market, right? Because it's about supply and, and demand. So, so long as inventory stays low, then uh, whatever buyers are out there, they have a very limited uh, pool from which to, to draw, and there, and that means that the prices have a lot of support because there's not a lot of inventory. Okay, so one of the contentions to, for the crash crashers is high, the inventory is highest it's ever been. It's never been this high. It wasn't this high in the two, you know, two thousand eight or whatever. Uh, Fred data didn't start measuring it until 2016. But if you clearly look at the housing levels here, they they cycle. We're we're low and going lower. Now, if you look at historically where we are, and if you look from January 2022 basically to the end of 2022, that's the run up we had where every year you can see housing inventory increases. But this puts it perspective. We got asked once about like, oh, we'll look at housing active inventory count. This is for the whole US. This is not for Vegas. So Vegas went all the way back up to 2019 normal levels. Mm -hmm. Nationally, that did not happen. But Vegas was one of the markets that went back to normal inventory, but is now declining again. Okay, So we'll, that was the first chart. Okay, the next chart, this is interesting. Household debt servant payments is a percent of disposable personal income. If you, this chart goes back to the early to the eighties, historically people pay between ten and thirteen percent of their total disposable income to a mortgage payment. It is nine point seven percent. Why? Why is that important? So everybody who's shouting about affordability, I mean, you're right. Homes are expensive, but when you're looking at this in context, now you're seeing that. Uh, because of the low interest rates that most people have on their mortgages, their percentage of their income that they're spending on their mortgage is actually lower than it generally has been historically. The other thing too is that remember over 40% of all people own a home free and clear. All of 40% of all homes are owned free and clear. So there's people, zeros are aver averaged into this. Mm -hmm. If you own your home free and clear, you're paying nothing toward a mortgage debt. Right. So when people say, no, that's not right because I just bought a house and I'm paying 28% of my income to my mortgage. You are, but most people aren't. Mm -hmm. And that also has helps with future like bad things that can happen in housing. Because clearly, if you look at the um, housing, when the housing market crashed, it was the 13%. Right. And we're not anywhere near that. The other thing to keep in mind is that this data also considers people who, for example, purchased their home 10 years ago, and their income has gone up over the 10-year period, but their mortgage payment has not. If anything, it's probably gone down because they refinanced at a lower rate. So all of these are thrown into the mix, and that's how they come up with this number. So when you're looking at it broadly throughout the economy, people are not spending a particularly large amount of their disposable income on housing. And the other thing, too, is when you look at this chart, it the bottom is eight. 
8%. So don't go, oh no, it's five times worse than it was six months ago. It's not, it's, it's like a percent higher. Um, this will track this every month, mm -hmm. but this is a very good sign for housing because 9.7 does not crash the housing market because it would have crashed every year for the last, you know, 40 years because it was higher. So it's actually, and yes, people that bought in the last six months are paying more as a percentage, sure. but they're not enough people. They're like half a percent of all homeowners. Right. Of all homeowners. It's right. not enough. Even if they all were in financial disarray, that wouldn't be enough to make a big deal. Right. Because remember, not everybody who owns a home purchased a home in the last six months. Okay. The next one is rental vacancy rate. Why this is interesting is because this is the rate of people who have investment properties that are, um, and if you see it the, during the housing peak, it was like 11% or something. Mm -hmm. Wanna, why were there so many vacant investment properties back during the housing crash? Twice as, more than twice as many as now. Right, so a couple of reasons. One, because some of them were, were newly purchased because people were, were, were buying a lot of investment properties. And of course, the, the flip side of that is because there was a lot of speculation and people had purchased these properties uh, without any, um, any money or had leveraged them 120% or whatever. So these properties were in the process of being foreclosed. So that, that's kind of the, the, those two yeah. ends of the spectrum. You can see the trend on this is dropping substantially. What this means is that the rental market is very healthy. 5% is literally the normal, like your, your rental is vacant and then you have to wait a couple weeks to put a new, you know, a new person in, right? Right. Because, you know, remember when a rental comes up vacant, most of the time you have to go in and do uh, either touch up paint or some minor repairs, or maybe uh, if the tenant's been there for a long time, maybe you have to paint the whole place and maybe have to do new flooring. So all of that takes time, but it all, it all kind of gets calculated into this vacancy rate. So it kind of gives you an idea of what goes into that. So it's not necessarily that these properties are on the market to be rented so much as they may also be in the process of getting renovated in order to be rented. Uh, the next one is vacant housing units in the United States. This is just all housing units. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is another uh, metric here. Um, it's This is very low. You can see the trend. It goes back. This chart goes back over 20 years. Obviously, the normal rate is that uh, 18, it says 18,000, but this chart's in thousands. So it's 18 million. Um, and you can see it tanked during the pandemic because you know, you couldn't evict people, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone was, people were sitting in houses. But you can see the trend here. It's continuing to drop. This is also great news for housing. Mm -hmm. This also is affected because new home builders have underbuilt the last decade, right? Right. So, you know, to your point, it wasn't just because you couldn't evict people during the pandemic. It's, it's because everybody was kind of frozen in place. You couldn't, you couldn't move anywhere. So it wasn't, so there were, there were a lot of things at play there. But yes, I mean, uh, the number of homes that are vacant is very low, which means that people are in their homes, whether they're, they're rented or they're homeowners, and people who are in their homes, um, that's a good sign. That also means that it's a healthy market where uh, people are making their payments, whether it's rent payments or mortgage payments. Yeah, exactly. And, and when the market's tight like that, it just makes it easier for investors to get rent money out, makes it more incentive. You know, if you own a bunch of rentals and you're like, gosh, I'm getting, you know, $2,000 a month on every rental. I'm going to go out and buy another one now mm -hmm. because my, all my rentals are rented. I'm not, I don't have this vacancy problem. It's just more incentive to do that, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, the next chart here, this is median list price per square foot. Now, as you can see, this is, this goes back to, it only goes back to 2017. Mm -hmm. You can all see what's happening here. First of all, notice that it's trending up. You can also see that it's cyclical, that it climbs and slightly descends. It climbs and slightly descends. We all know that median list price is the lowest in October, November, but it's also highest in like April, mm -hmm. which is the peaks. Okay. You can see the July, the run up in 2022 where home prices spiked. They did decline, but notice that they didn't decline more than they were at the start of the year. They're still well above year over year, right? Right. Here's another interesting thing. When we, the last time we looked at this data, it was going down, but you can see that now that we have another month of data at the end, it's going back up again. So Wana, list price is going up 
that's a leading indicator. Right. So this is kind of what's interesting to me. And um, but what, what I want to share here is that appraisals look back. They look at where we've been. List prices and broker price opinions, which is what realtors provide, are forward looking. And so this is kind of a, a very interesting thing because this is where a realtor and somebody in the industry like us comes in very handy because we can see what's coming rather than where we've been. Everybody can tell you where we've been, but it takes somebody with market knowledge to tell you where we're going. The other interesting thing about this is we saw this in the Vegas data where the the sale prices have basically are even in Vegas, meaning they're they haven't they've stopped going down. Mm -hmm. But then we noticed the last two updates we did for Vegas, condos and single family homes, list prices are now higher. Mm -hmm. And we said that in zero, it's zero, there's a zero percent chance in declining markets, list prices are rising because sellers wouldn't come on the market higher when the market's falling. They right. tend to chase the market down. Right. So, but remember, this is a leading indicator. We won't actually know what these properties close at for 45 days. Right. The other thing that this tells you is that there are properties coming on the market that maybe have been renovated. So remember in the fall when prices were, were really soft, investors came in, they purchased properties, they've spent this time renovating the properties. So now these same properties that they've purchased in the fall are now coming on the market. So that's part of the reason why you're seeing that why you're seeing this higher number. These flips are coming on the market. So that, that's an interesting uh, little piece of the market to consider. This next chart is homeowner vacancy rate. Uh, this would be, what would this, first of all, the number's 0.8%. Mm -hmm. That means that 99% of all homeowner homes owned by people are occupied. Mm -hmm. It's the lowest it's ever been recorded. It's never been recorded this low. Uh, why is this good for pending foreclosures in that moving forward? Right. So when, you know, for our purposes, when almost 100% of the homes out there are occupied, that tells us that people are making their mortgage payments. People are not abandoning their homes. That makes for a healthy market. That make, means that people are not getting foreclosed. So when you're seeing that, you know, 0.2% that, um, that, that are, are vacant. So, you know, those homes could be in all kinds of, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, usually one of the reasons is that maybe had, somebody has passed away. So th the house is vacant and, and the heirs are trying to figure out what, what to do with it. Maybe the home is being renovated. There are all kinds of reasons besides people not making their mortgage payments and getting foreclosed why the property would be vacant. But it's such a small number that it's negligible in the market regardless of the reason why that property is vacant. The other thing is it's normally about 1.5%. And if you look at the peak there, it was about 3% when the housing market crashed. And now it's like, you can see the massive difference between where it was and where it is. Like this is, this is a sign of a very strong housing market like mm -hmm. it's there's this if if you believe there is downside risk that home prices will crash because of the, whatever foreclosures that you think are going to happen this doesn't this data doesn't indicate that's going to happen mm -hmm. like that just shows right. that okay this next one is my favorite one we're going to have to talk about it for a second this is median days on market okay this is the one we got called that there was always the time on the market was never very long and it was always very short. We said, no, it's always been pretty high. Okay. Now, a lot of people are going to look at this and say, look at the rapid rate of, the, of that increase right there. But notice it does that every year if you go all the way to the left of the chart, which is 2017. Notice how it shot up and then it just like turned and shot when it went back down. And then the next year it shot up and went back down and shot went down. It did that every year except for 2000 where it, it did its normal decline and shot up a little, went back down and then shot up. So if you look at all those peaks, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and then January 23. First of all, the 75 is still lower than every year before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But you know what's interesting? Every one of those peaks is January. And I kid you not, I went through every one and checked like, what. The, it's the, the most, so what we're going to see when we, in a month, when we do the video is you're going to see this will drop. The, the average days on the market will decline, um, should decline, but because it's done it every single year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it looks like the, and we also saw the declining inventory number. So right. that's going to help move this along. But it looks like if you would have, if you were to have looked at this chart any year, 
with the January data, you would think it's just going to keep going to the moon, right? Like a SpaceX uh, rocket, but it's not. It's going to turn. So um, yeah, it did decline. It did increase a lot. And a lot of people freaked out when they saw this and started screaming about a crash. But what are you seeing anecdotally? I know this is Vegas. And this is like a super thing. Um, is forward-looking stuff, what are you seeing? I'm seeing uh, decreased days on the market. I'm seeing, and this is just anecdotal. Right, sure. You know, just looking at, at properties that, that I'm touching on a daily basis, I'm seeing decreased days on the market. Uh, I'm seeing, like I said a moment ago, um, you know, people who did renovations who, you know, coming back on the market at a much more um, um, optimistic number. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, but what's interesting to me with those optimistic numbers, so I'm going to give you kind of a, um, a little, little story. There was a house that I represented. It sold for three fifty a few months ago. Uh, the investor went ahead and renovated the house, put it back on the market for I think four eighty. Uh, yeah, it was one hundred thirty more. Yeah, and I think it sold like in a week. <laughs> so the flippers are still out there. Yeah, they're still making money. Yeah. Now, now I, I can tell you, he did not put in one hundred thirty thousand dollars into the house. <laughs> certainly not. No, he, he probably put in probably closer to 50000 But this is important. This is why you can't just take a data point. Like the people who say, but, but Todd, the builder down the street just dropped a price on a house, $50,000. So that, that means oh, prices have dropped. No, that. So then in this case, the home prices are up 25% instantly. <laughs> Magically, they're just up 25% because this guy just bought the house and sold it for four eighty when he bought it for three fifty. Right. No, he fixed it. You know, he probably put... 50 grand. He maybe did a full rehab. 50 grand it looks probably looks much okay. nicer. So, so I want to make a point about all these renovations and, and the flip what the flippers do. Um, and we say it's a full renovation. It's not. None of them are full renovations. What they are, they are cosmetic renovations, okay? Yeah. They are cosmetic renovations because a full renovation would also imply that, that they're dealing with what's inside the walls and underground and they're not dealing with any of that. They're just dealing with cosmetics. So when you read someplace that, you know, this house has been totally renovated, please understand that very rarely is the house truly totally renovated. Most of the time it is a cosmetic renovation. If I spend the 50 or 60,000 bucks to redo all the wiring and all the plumbing and all that stuff that you can't see mm -hmm. and just tell you, oh, but there's $60,000 of non-cosmetic structural things we fixed, you won't care. Mm -hmm. All you care about when you walk in and you see the brand new fixtures in the kitchen and the bathrooms have been redone with new light bars and the you know paint and carpet and new cabinets that's all people care about mm -hmm. that's what the that's what gets their eyes all excited but they right. are like oh i don't care if you spent $60,000 on this other stuff i can't see it right they're, they're interested in the ice cream not the broccoli <laughs> right yeah sorry okay all right so what did you guys think did you like the charts was this interesting uh, did any of this surprise you Please leave us comments and tell us what you thought. Uh, we like listening to you and we like, uh, we like your ideas. You know, even when you're saying something that, that, that you disagree with us. Or makes absolutely no sense at all. But then again, do you have to do this? You have to subscribe. And this is why. Because <laughs> in a month, we're going to use, we're going to pull out the same chart. And I predict everything we said going forward in a month, all five predictions will all happen next month. There you go. So, um, you know, if you're... If you thought that my eye rolling at Todd was funny, then subscribe, hit the notification bell, right. <laughs> like the video, <laughs> share the video, uh, leave us a love note, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye. <laughs>